Well, good evening, everyone. It's good to see all of you here this evening. Thank you so much for coming and joining us for this event. One quick logistical note, I know there are some folks handing out flyers outside the theater, which they're of course free to do so, but just so there's no confusion, those folks weren't affiliated with the theater or BioLogos. But we're grateful to all of you for coming out to listen and explore and learn about these topics together from two wonderful speakers. My name is David Buller, I'm Director of Programs at BioLogos, and on behalf of all of us at BioLogos, we are so excited to welcome all of you here this evening. We're grateful also to Transforming the Bay with Christ and a number of other churches and groups in the Bay Area here who have helped to get the word out about this event here this evening. And thanks to all of you for making time to come explore and learn these topics together. As we begin, I'd like to introduce our moderator for this evening's event, Curtis Chang. Curtis has worked on issues of faith and public life in a wide variety of ministry and secular contexts over the years. An example of his recent work includes co-founding Christians and the Vaccine, a major project to respond to vaccine hesitancy and questions among Christians, especially in the midst of the COVID pandemic. This is work that also led to his testifying on these topics before the US Senate. Many of you will recognize him as host of the Good Faith podcast, which explores how Christian faith intersects with culture, law, and politics. He is also on the faculty of Duke Divinity School, is a senior fellow at Fuller Theological Seminary, and serves on the board of directors of BioLogos. Curtis, welcome. You are here to hear our speakers, Dr. Deborah Harzma and Dr. Francis Collins. My job here is to tell you a little bit about the organization that brought the two of them together in the first place and actually is responsible for bringing all of you here together, and that's this organization, BioLogos. Now, to illustrate the importance of BioLogos, I want to tell you just a snippet of an important moment in my own faith journey. I became a Christian at Faith Bible Church in a conservative part of the Midwest. Uh, Faith Bible Church was a lovely church, taught me a lot about the Bible. It did have a blind spot. It really did not prepare me for integrating the life of the mind with the life of faith. And that blind spot came back to haunt me my freshman year as a freshman at Harvard, where for the first time as an 18-year-old, I encountered learned professors, not so much making a direct hostile attack on Christianity, but doing something that was probably even more corrosive for an 18 year old. They would speak about biblical faith in a dismissive, almost condescending tone, usually with along something along the lines that of course, science has disproven X, Y, and Z. X, Y, and Z being just what Faith Bible Church had taught me all of my life. And so that threw me into a massive crisis of doubt. I wasn't sure if I could really be a Christian and still be somebody who was at Harvard, who believed in the mind, who believed in science. And because we, didn't, as students, could not identify a single professor at Harvard who was a Christian, at least at that time, uh, my mind scanned to the next best thing I could find. And that was the senior, uh, senior student who was the president of the InterVarsity Christian Fellowship that I had just joined. And his name was John Young. And he was a pre-med, but also majored in religion. And just to give you a sense of his mind, he eventually became an MD, PhD, and now is a department chair at uh, Hofstra uh, School of Medicine. All that was in the future. At that moment, I just saw somebody who could possibly be a lifeline for clinging on to my faith. So I asked John Young out to lunch. This was my first semester freshman year. The fact that as an 18 year old you would do that to a senior shows you how desperate I was. And I, we sat down, I remember, because it was Quincy House, I remember exactly where we were, and I said, John, I know we don't have time to go through all of the issues, all of my doubts, uh, all of the things I've heard. Just please, for this lunch, just tell me one thing. Can you be a Christian and be a person of intellectual integrity? Can you be a Christian and believe in science? And he looked at me and he said, yes, absolutely. 
and I'd be happy to share you how I got there. And I said, great, that's all I need for now. And that's what, I just needed something to stay in the game, to stay in the game of faith. And then over the years, in the subsequent years, I did do the hard work of reading, studying, conversations, sometimes, often with John, who has become a lifelong friend of mine, he's a groomsman at my, wed my wedding, uh, to travel this path of how do we join faith and science. Now, I tell that story because that crisis of faith is being replayed every year, countless times, among Christian youth. And not all of them have a John Young. And this is where BioLogos is so vitally important. Because BioLogos is the institutional John Young for countless Christians growing up asking these questions. And BioLogos responds with the same answer. Yes, you can. Let me show you how I got there. As an institution, it is the preeminent voice for this reconciling vision of faith and science, which saves, which preserves spiritual life. But BioLogos does more than just preserve spiritual life. It preserves physical, actual life. And I experienced this when I started Christians in the Vaccine, trying to address the rampant uh, vaccine resistance and hesitancy and suspicion among evangelicals. Evangelicals were dying because of their refusal to take the vaccine. And I wanted to produce a video that would address some of the leading questions that they were asking. But I needed the equivalent of my John Young. And I knew who that was, who that role model was to promote this vision. It was Francis Collins. But I didn't know him personally, but I did know about BioLogos. So I reached out to BioLogos and with a nimbleness and speed that reflects their identity as a mission-driven organization, BioLogos put me in touch with Francis Collins. We filmed the video, distributed it, and the video has been studied to show by researchers at Stanford and Columbia to actually have been effective in persuading evangelicals to get vaccinated. We don't know how many lives that video saved, but we know it saved some. And for that, I'm deeply grateful to BioLogos. BioLogos doesn't, though, just preserve spiritual and, and physical life. It is also going to be, I believe, crucial to preserving life on our planet. Because science tells us that climate change is accelerating at a pace that does threaten the flourishing of life on our planet. And the scale of the problem means that the only effective solutions that have a chance at blunting this disastrous outcome are going to be solutions that command widespread political support. And that means evangelicals, once again, are going to need to be persuaded to uh, believe in science as compatible with their faith, which right now, less than 25% of them believe climate change is even a serious problem. And BioLogos has committed itself to, to lead the charge on this front, and that's why I joined the board of BioLogos, was to get in that absolutely necessary game. And animating BioLogos is this beautiful vision of the union of faith and science as something that is beautiful and true. And here to take us into that vision first is our first speaker, Dr. Deborah Harzma. Deb is the president of BioLogos, and she got her uh, PhD in astrophysics at MIT and has went on to become the professor and chair in the Department of Physics uh, and Astronomy at Calvin University. Uh, and she has written the book Origins, which along with her husband uh, explores the different ways we think about the origins of life and the universe. And in her pres as, a, as president of BioLogos, she continues to speak and lead the effort around promoting this union and reunion of faith and science. So it's with my great pleasure, please join with me in welcoming Dr. Deborah Harzma. Well, it is a pleasure to be with all of you here this evening. Thank you so much for coming out and spending the evening with us. And yes, as Curtis said, I am an astronomer. And here is a picture of me at a telescope that I used. And the telescope is indeed very large, and it is called the Very Large Array. <laughs> Astronomers are not known for creative names of their telescopes. <laughs> um, but it's a, a radio telescope in New Mexico, and I got to use this to study the universe. Uh, galaxies, galaxy clusters, the curvature of space, the expansion of the universe, and, you know, nothing big. 
and it was a wonderful experience. Uh, I uh, just loved being out there, being in the control room, being able to walk outside and look at the night sky and detect these signals coming from, from space. Now, I'm not the only one who geeks out over science. A lot of people do this. Um, I know a chemist who has his favorite protein. Like, wow, I can't even tell one protein from another. Here's somebody who has a favorite. And I know a biologist who has her favorite bone in the body. <laughs> now, my husband is a physicist, and he, when he's teaching his students, he will make them cheer out loud when uh, he introduces a new fundamental law of nature. You know, like, yay, law of gravity, yay. Um, so yes, we are both uh, scientists at home, so it's a little bit geeky. Um, for Valentine's one day, I got these earrings, which, you know, it looks pretty, but it is an actual map of the universe. This is a map of the cosmic microwave background radiation. I told him I would just love to have earrings like that, and he found them for me. So for Valentine's Day, he bought me the universe. <laughs> now, one reason I got into studying radio astronomy is because it's detecting signals that our eyes cannot see. Now, this is a picture at wavelengths that our eyes can see. The blob in the middle is a very large galaxy, um, about um, a thousand times the size of the Milky Way. It contains trillions of stars. And in this picture, you see that blob, and then you see a lot of small bits of galaxies or uh, faint stars as well. But when you take an image of that at radio wavelengths, so we're detecting radio waves from outer space and turning them into an image, this is what it looks like. That's amazing. You see these jets of gas that are shooting far out from the galaxy, thousands of light years into space, forming this huge plume of material. Um, there's physics happening out there that we can't possibly replicate here on Earth. And that is one of the reasons that I fell in love with doing astrophysics. Now, uh, studying regions like this, this is uh, that galaxy at the center is part of a cluster of galaxies. This next picture is a picture of a particularly rich cluster of galaxies. This comes from the Hubble T Space Telescope, and one of our board members here tonight, Jennifer Wiseman, is the uh, chief scientist for the Hubble Space Telescope. And I just love this image. It's so rich and packed with galaxies. Um, the curvature of space is evident here in those curved arcs that you see. And it, it just fills me with wonder, with curiosity to know more. Can we map it? Can we figure out how that works? And it's uh, just, we didn't even know systems like this existed 100, 150 years ago. So it is a wonderful time to be an astronomer with all the new images coming in. I'll have an image later from the James Webb Space Telescope. Now, I think most scientists and most people have that sense of wonder. When you walk outside, when you walk along the beach or through a forest and you breathe in that fresh air, you know how that feels? You just go, oh, wow. You're experiencing that sense of wonder and awe at the creation. Now, that promotes a mindfulness, a sense of spirituality. But when you actually believe in God, that takes on another level. Because we sense that there is a person behind the universe, someone to thank for how amazing the universe is. And that spirit of gratitude is something that I feel when I look at these images through the telescope and see the amazing things in God's creation. Now, as a Christian, it goes another layer. Not only is there a person behind the universe, but it's the same person that I know as my Savior. So it's the same person as Jesus Christ who walked this planet. And as a Christian, I believe that is someone that I am, can pray to, someone who has forgiven me for my faults, who desires to know me. And to know that as the same person who created the vastness of those galaxy clusters, oh, that's incredible. And that is a reason why I follow Jesus Christ. For me, Christian faith is not a political position. It is a daily choice to follow this amazing God and to dwell on God's love for me and my love for God in return. 
So that means for me, there isn't a separation between science and my faith. I mean, for me, doing science is exploring this world that God has created. So that makes it all the more troubling that in our culture, things have gotten so polarized that somehow everything gets decided, divided into two camps. You're either on one side or the other. And somehow science has ended up on one side and religion, especially Christianity, has ended up on the other. And it makes no sense to me. These things go integrally well together. When I'm doing my science, I'm living out my faith and my religious commitments. So the polarization has, uh, there's a lot of causes of this, and uh, Francis Collins in his talk will dwell on more of those. But just as a few examples, um, there, are, there were the new atheists. Richard Dawkins um, wrote a book on the God delusion, how science is facts, but spirituality is just a delusion and superstition. Jerry Coyne would write that um, people who are really smart, they wouldn't be religious because smart people are all, would follow science and science has disproven religion. Now, anytime somebody comes up and says a whole group of people are stupid, like, really? Thanks, Jerry. You know, it's just a little insulting. Um, but so that amps up language on one side, but of course then you have Christians on the other who are feeling that and reacting to it. Um, I met somebody who's, uh, who had been vaccinated and was trying to persuade his mother to be vaccinated. And he asked his mother what her concern was. And she said, well, I can't be vaccinated. That's what the scientists are saying. Like, it wasn't a, um, she was a Christian, but it wasn't a biblical concern. It wasn't a, a theological concern. It was because scientists had said that. And so that's the state of polarization that we are in. And you have stories like what Curtis referred to, where you have young people feeling trapped of like, is it possible to have intellectual integrity and follow faith? We have scientists who might be, who are hungry, searching for meaning and purpose and uh, a, a sense of, of the greater perspective, even sensing that there might be an intelligence behind the universe. But if they feel like all Christians are rejecting science, there's no path for them to faith in God either. So I, a breakdown of trust has led to a crisis of truth. Now, Francis Collins will address more about COVID and vaccination. Today, I want to talk some about climate change, and not because I'm a climate, sci climate scientist myself, but I see the place of our planet in the universe, and I care about the fate of our planet. And so it's distressing to learn that something like 30% of white evangelicals say that, um, only 30% say that climate change is a very serious issue. Whereas when you ask atheists or people of no religion, something like 70% would say it is a very serious issue. And it grieves my heart. This is more than a difference of opinion. This is impacting real lives. It's impacting people who are suffering the effects of climate change. It's, we've lost opportunities to slow the pace of climate change. And it's distorting our understanding of both science and Christianity in the public square. So, um, I believe that Christian beliefs, Christian faith itself is not the fundamental problem here. I think that the data shows pretty clearly that it is political affiliations that are driving this division. You can ask people their religious perspective, their political perspective, and everything aligns with their political views. So I don't think religious faith is the problem. In fact, I think the Christian faith has fruitful perspectives to bring that are relevant for the scientific questions that we are facing today. And that we need both science and faith working hand in hand to address these serious questions. So one thing to remember is that evangelical is now a political grouping. So Let's think of other Christian groups. Actually, many Christian groups are not anti-science. Um, for example, in that statistic of how many feel that climate change is a very serious problem, among black Protestants, the percentage is 68%. So it isn't Christian faith fundamentally that is the problem. Historically, uh, some of the leading scientists who launched the scientific revolution were people of deep Christian faith. 
So I'm thinking of Galileo, of Kepler, Copernicus, of um, Boyle. And these are all scientists who, they weren't just nominally Christian because they lived in a Christian culture, but they wrote about their faith. And I'll give an example of that later on. So now you might be thinking at this point, wait a second, she said she's an astronomer and she's saying she's a Christian and there's no conflict, but what about Genesis? And I actually get that question when I talk to secular audiences. People who are atheists and agnostic are some of the ones who have some of the biggest questions. Like, just a second, what about the Bible? Doesn't the Bible say that it's only six days of creation? So let me briefly give an answer to that. I tell my perspective on that and my personal story on that in this book, Origins, which I wrote with my husband, the uh, physicist. And we, I grew up in a church that had evangelical in the name. This was back when evangelical meant evangelism, and it was a wonderful church. Um, <laughs> so um, this church loved the Bible. They taught me the scriptures. They taught me how to share my faith and communicate that to others. And they encouraged me in my schoolwork, encouraged me to pursue science. But in our church, we only knew of two options for the age of the earth. Either it is six days, as we read in Genesis 1, with God as the creator, or it's billions of years without God. And given the choice between those two, we're gonna choose the one with God, okay? So it took me a while to work through this myself. Um, it was actually when I was in graduate school that I studied, decided to study astrophysics and realized, wow, I really need to sort this out. And um, I was involved in a group called InterVarsity. Um, I think there might be some InterVarsity folks here. Yay. There we go, <laughs> figure they're up there. And um, that, that was a group I had uh, peers here who were, uh, like Curtis's experience at Harvard, I was at MIT studying this, and there was a, um, a wonderful group of other Christian students who were wrestling with the same questions. And we read books together, and one of those um, books, more than one I think, was um, Old Testament scholars, the people who know the original Hebrew, the original context of Genesis 1, who were um, describing and helping me understand for the first time what that ancient culture was like. And in that ancient world, of course, they didn't even know the earth was a sphere. They thought the earth was flat. They thought there was a solid dome sky. That's how they pictured the sky with an ocean of water for where the rain came from. And they believed um, the, the ancient Egyptians and Babylonians, the culture surrounding the ancient Israelites believed that there were gods inhabiting each part of that picture. And so then when you read Genesis 1 in that light, it becomes clear that God isn't trying to correct their scientific misconceptions, isn't trying to put scientific information into there, but instead is showing that there is one God who created all the aspects of the cosmos, and there aren't these multiple gods and deities around, and that creation is good, and that humans are a very good part of God's creation. And so I decided if God wasn't trying to put science into Genesis 1, I shouldn't be trying to get science out of Genesis 1. But instead, these other messages that were God's main point. So that's how I put it together, and you're welcome to check out that book for more. So the impasse here is strong, but the title of our event is Beyond the Impasse. And I believe that Christian faith can bring fruitful ways forward that are relevant and needed in today's scientific world. So I wanna share with you four areas where I see Christian faith and the scientific enterprise actually sharing some common values. So first of these is the idea that nature is comprehensible. So let me take you back to my freshman physics class. I had a wonderful teacher, Dick Peterson, and he, um, every week we did a new um, lab experiment following the instructions. And then one week he said, okay, now you're gonna design your own experiments. And so you can picture a bunch of kids sitting around looking at a bunch of equipment like, what in the world do we do here? We gotta figure out something to measure. And eventually we figured something out and we measured stuff. And then we turned to the textbook. And we're like, okay, we gotta find some equations here. And we found some equations and we calculated some stuff. And then it matched. Like, whoa, it worked. We were amazed. Of course, we were hoping it would work, but it actually worked. And I was also amazed on the level like, 
why should that work? Why should these equations in this textbook actually match what's going on in this physical world of objects and motions? And that spoke to me of the intelligence behind the universe, that this universe isn't um, unpredictable and purposeless, but rather there is an intelligence with a plan that is governing things so faithfully that we can write down equations to describe it. Now, to do science, you need to believe nature is comprehensible, that we can actually write down those equations and learn how it works. And this Christian perspective gives this bedrock foundation for why a Christian would pursue science in that way. It might seem obvious today that nature is comprehensible, but if you think of most cultures around the world, in pre-scientific times, they thought of it as gods and spirits inhabiting different parts of nature. And, you know, you can't describe what's going to happen next. Who knows what the gods are going to do next? But in the Christian perspective, you can actually study this and investigate those underlying processes in the natural world. So that's one value. Another value uh, shared between the scientific enterprise and Christian faith is curiosity. Scientists are curious. We just want to figure out what is going on. We ask so many questions. And I love how nature uh, can be, cu people can be curious about nature at all stages of knowledge and age. So you have five-year-olds that I've talked to who are so curious about the planets. And they know all these facts and have all these questions about planets. And I taught my college students about things like black holes and supernova explosions. They were curious to hear all about those. And I've worked with um, scientists at the cutting edge, all curious about what is dark matter, what is dark energy, what is going on there in the universe. We are curious. And as Christians, well, the scripture supports that. God invited Adam to name the animals. And uh, Solomon investigated all of the plants. And there's passage after passage that describes nature as praising God. It says the rocks will cry out, or the trees will uh, praise God, or the heavens will declare the glory of God. And if all of these natural objects around us are praising God, well, it's worth paying attention to them and being curious about how they work. What, how is that rock being the most rocky thing it can be? And, um, and by doing so, praising the one who created it. So curiosity is another value. We have the comprehensibility of nature. We have curiosity. And then another one is humility. Now, I'm not saying that all Christians are humble, because that's probably not the case. I'm not saying that all scientists are humble either. There is plenty of arrogance to go around. I'm talking about a specific kind of humility, which is humility in the face of truth. And for scientists, uh, the, our professional standard is, is when the data says something, we have to change our ideas to match the data. You cannot just sit back in your chair and think, oh, this is the way I think the world should be. You have to let go of your favorite ideas when you investigate the natural world and discover it saying something differently. Now, uh, I chose uh, this image here of Robert Boyle uh, because he wrote about this in the 1600s. And he... Uh, described how humility was part of his scientific work and how that fostered it in his Christian faith. So on the uh, right there, I believe is the one where I have uh, the cover page of his book, The Christian Vir Virtuoso, showing that by being addicted to experimental philosophy, a man is rather assisted and indisposed to be a good Christian. Okay, let me translate. If you have a passion for experimental science uh, you, and a willingness to be curious, then that fits really great with following Jesus and with being a good Christian and imitating, what, uh, imitating Christ and following God because it fosters that humility. And I can feel that in my own work when I am doing my research and like, oh man, we've got to change my ideas here. It, it very much resonates with the humility to be a Christian, to recognize I have faults, I have not measured up to what God is asking us to be, and I need forgiveness. I have to change my ways. All right, so I've talked about the 
three values so far that science and Christianity share. The idea that nature is comprehensible, curiosity, and humility. And my last one here is service. So there are so many people working in STEM fields who are doing so out of a service and a desire to serve others. We have people working in healthcare, caring for patients. We have people caring for the natural world, documenting um, the, the welfare of creatures in our ecosystems or documenting the climate. And we have people working in engineering and technology and biotech, finding better devices and products that will um, bring about better health and better human flourishing. And people are passionate about those things. And that fits so well with ideas of Christian service. Um, in the scriptures, the, the author of the Gospel of Luke, Luke, was a physician himself. And Jesus Christ was healed so many people in, uh, in his work. So that attitude of service and of serving others is just built in. And you see it throughout um, Christian history, Christians were the ones who traveled the world to found hospitals and to found schools out of a desire to care for others. And if we can tap into that essence of Christianity, what Christianity is really teaching, we will be better prepared for the challenges facing us to treat them with an attitude of service, of self-sacrifice, imitating Christ. And because some of the issues that, coming, that are coming our way are gonna require some sacrifice. So I want to talk a little bit more about climate change. And you don't need me here to tell you about forest fires. <laughs> You're experiencing them in this area uh, in recent years, so, so severe. And that is just but one symptom of the changing climate on our planet. Uh, it, I remember when I first was learning about climate change, I'm like, okay, yeah, I guess that's a thing. And this was like in the 90s and early aughts. And, uh, and then somebody explained to me, you know, here in Michigan, it's not gonna be so bad, but like in Bangladesh, the sea level is gonna rise and it's gonna impact millions of people. I was like, wow. My husband and I were at that time supporting a missionary in Bangladesh who was working on uh, teaching people to read and economic development. I was cared about the people of Bangladesh. They're the ones who are gonna be impacted by climate change? Oh my goodness. I got motivated pretty quickly. And that, that human impact of climate change is something that can be very motivating for Christians and that we can tap into. There's a, that survey that I've given, been giving stats from, it did have a bright note on this point. It said 92% of highly religious people, including white evangelicals, said, believed that God gave humans a duty to protect and care for the earth, including plants and animals. Can we tap into that, that belief that we do have a duty to care? How can we do that better? So it's time for Christians to take this calling seriously. Now I put here the face of Catherine Hayhoe and the cover of her recent book, um, Saving Us. And if you have not yet heard a talk by Catherine Hayhoe, I encourage you tonight when you go home, Google her online, Google her now. Uh, save a link uh, to watch a talk later or get her book. She's been very open about her Christian faith all along throughout her career and uh, she is also a climate scientist herself and bringing some of the best messaging on this. Somebody was just telling me that their atheist friends absolutely love Catherine Hayhoe and figure she has got the message for our world today because she is bringing a message of hope. She's very honest about exactly what the issues are and the, how dire the situation is, but she also is articulating methods that work. There are solutions whether private sector or government solutions, but different um, uh, localities and people groups where you can find solutions that reduce the carbon and also bring better human flourishing and bring more jobs. It's not a zero sum game. Now, I know that there's a couple of big problems facing people that, that are barriers for people to engage and take action on climate change. On the one side, you have people who are where I was 20 some years ago thinking, yeah, yeah, I guess that's a thing. Um, and they're kind of apathetic and are not engaged in it or not accepting it. But Christian, uh, 
when people hear about this motivation of the human impact of climate change, I think that can be very motivating for Christians to say, okay, this is something that really matters. Another challenge is that, as I said, we're gonna to need to make sacrifices. But you know what? That is so integral to our faith too. The Christian hope that we are called to is one that is gonna be an active hope. It's not a pie in the sky, rosy picture sort of hope that brushes aside problems. Christian, the, the Bible's pretty clear that um, bad things are gonna happen and following Jesus Christ is gonna involve sacrifice and difficulty. So the, that is something that I, I hope we can tap into and that can help be part of our Christian faith of living this out. Maybe Christians can even become the leaders in addressing climate change. On the other side, there's another challenge, and that's people who are very aware of the dire situation and the data on climate change are tempted to despair and actually are suffering mental health challenges over this. Or at a minimum, just checking out saying, you know, I agree there's a huge problem, but nothing I do can make a difference. And that's where Christian hope can really play a, a major role as well. Because this is an active hope. It's not a hope that just sits back. Because in Christianity, we are called to obey God, to love our neighbor. One of Jesus' biggest commands is to love our neighbor. And he didn't say, well, you know, I'll be coming back soon so you don't need to do it. And no, we are supposed to do it now because he will be coming back. And this is how we live out that hope of Christ's return. So... Overall, I think an active Christian hope is what this world needs, and an active and engaged Christian church over the whole world taking action on this issue. Well, to close today, I want to zoom back out to the universe and think a little bit more about our place in the cosmos. So I brought for you, uh, here's the image, and I'm gonna play a video in a moment. This is a computer simulation done by a group at the Riken Institute in Japan, and it is a huge swath of the universe. This is millions of light years across. And each of those blobs that you see there is an entire galaxy, it's representing a galaxy. And here's what it looks like when you fly around that simulation. So if you could fly you know, thousands of light years a second and just fly through the galaxies, it would look something like this. Isn't that stunning? The galaxies aren't uniformly spread through space, but there's these uh, large empty voids, but then there's sheets of galaxies and filaments, and where they intersect, you have these rich clusters of galaxies. It's incredibly vast. And our humanity and our planet can feel pretty small compared to a picture like that. So there uh, was a headline last uh, fall in the Atlantic that said, um, life is an accident in space and time. And I'm like, what? Who is saying that? And I went and read the article, and it was by Alan Lightman, who's an MIT physicist, and he actually wasn't saying that. It was the editor of the uh, magazine decided that was the title that was going to catch people's attention, and it's tapped into the idea that science is somehow showing that life is an accident in space and time. Very small in the universe, therefore very insignificant, and, uh, and somehow just an accidental and purposeless. And this is where, that is not what science itself is saying. Science can't make those conclusions. And this is where we need more than science. We need philosophy and religion, whatever your religion is, it's, it, it's those bigger questions that are gonna help us address meaning and purpose. And I feel that the Christian faith is particularly robust in those areas. Because this question of meaning and our place in the universe isn't a new one. It goes back to one of King David's Psalms, Psalm 8, where it says, "O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And when I consider your heavens, the moon and the stars that you have put in place, the galaxies and the clusters of galaxies and all the dark matter that you've put in space, what is humankind that you are mindful of them and humanity that you should care for them? This is not a new question. People have looked up at the night sky and wondered about the significance of humanity. 
But then the psalm goes on and gives an answer to that question. It says, but you have created us a little lower than God, a little lower than the heavenly beings, and crowned us with glory and honor. God has created humankind with intention and given us a special place in the universe. That is where our significance comes from, not from our physical size, not from our ability to think and reason, but it becomes from our creator. We are created beings, and we are created by a creator who loves us. And that creator's given us a special role. The psalm goes on to say that uh, you've placed all things under their feet, the flocks and the herds and the trees and everything on the planet. Now, placing under their feet, that's a, 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 an idiom for talking about being responsible for, being the responsible leader of uh, a, a community, you know, if it's in a governmental sense, but here as being the ones to care for this planet. And we are called to care for things the way God cares for them, to be God's image bearers and represent God in caring for the planet. And I can tell you astronomically, our planet is this oasis in space. This is this iconic image from the Apollo astronauts uh, orbiting the moon and taking this picture and sending it back on uh, Christmas Day. And you just see this blue marble in this sea of darkness. And the marvel, those astronauts, they had to bring with them everything, air, water, food, heat, protection from radiation. They couldn't, everything they had to bring with them. Whereas here on this planet, it's a garden. You can walk around and just breathe the air and drink the water and eat what grows. This is the beautiful garden that God has given us. And obviously we should care for it. This picture also reminds me of another thing. And that is our God, who created all of that vast network of galaxies, chose to become human, to take on human flesh, and to walk this planet, to walk the streets of Palestine, and to set aside everything for our sake, and to humble himself to the point of dying a horrific death, just to call us back to him. That is the depth of the incredible love of the creator of this universe. And whenever I think of that, I fall in love with Jesus Christ all over again. To God be the glory. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Judd. Our next speaker needs no introduction, but I have to do it. Uh, it's Dr. Francis Collins, one of the world's leading scientists and geneticists. Uh, he's the founder of BioLogos, where he's now also the senior fellow. He's probably most known for leading the international collaboration to map the human genome, which is widely considered one of the seminal achievements in the, histories, the history of science. And for that work, he was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom and the National Medal of Science. Uh, perhaps even more astounding to me is that in 2009, he was appointed the director of the National Institutes of Health, and he served three presidents until 2021. If you think about our last three presidents, that's an amazing accomplishment. Um, I don't know how he did it. Um, and including in that term, those terms, oversight of the country's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, 2006, Francis wrote the best-selling book, The Language of God, that tells his journey from atheism to biblical faith, which is a fascinating account. I encourage you, all of you, to get that book if you haven't read it. And it was the tremendous response to that book that led to the founding of BioLogos. Um, in 2020, Francis Collins was awarded the Templeton Prize, joining a prestigious group, including Mother Teresa, Desmond Tutu, and Billy Graham. All that is wonderful, but if I could paraphrase uh, Paul, in 1 Corinthians 13, uh, you can have all the awards in the world, but if you have not love, you are nothing. And I've had the privilege of just getting to know Francis a little bit, and the thing that I most want to commend him for is being a man of love, a man of deep love, of truth, of love of his fellow human being, and most of all, a love of God. So welcome, Dr. Francis Collins. Thank you. 
Thank you, Curtis, for incredibly kind introduction. And I hope you have that same sense of awe that I did looking at those amazing photographs uh, that Dr. Harsma showed you. And you can't be, I think, in a place of looking at those images without feeling this sense of God's greatness. And yet, here we are, able to have relationship with that same God and to uh, the process of science, which is our opportunity to explore God's creation, to see the beauty and to be even more in awe. Some scientists say, you know, the more we study, the less we have awe because we understand it. That's not true at all. The more we study, the more we are amazed at the creation that we find uh, with our scientific endeavors. Well, I am indeed honored to be part of this gathering here. I'm clear across the country from where I usually hang out. We've had a wonderful two and a half days already in the Bay Area uh, with meeting with pastors and talking with a lot of people in Silicon Valley who seem to me are hungry for something other than just technology uh, to fill their hearts and their spirits. And we think we know what they're looking for. But what I want to talk about this evening, I'll say a little bit about my own brief journey um, from where I started out as a kid growing up in a family where no faith was practiced to where I am. But then I particularly want to talk about science, faith, truth, and trust, and where we are right now, and how critical it's going to be for all of us who are believers and for all churches to find a path forward here to try to address what has turned into really a very troubling divisiveness and a place where sometimes even truth itself seems to be under attack. Jesus said, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We need to anchor ourselves to that search, and that's part of what I hope we can talk about this evening. In terms of my own pathway, I was an atheist when I was a graduate student studying quantum mechanics. I decided to go to medical school because life science was getting more interesting than what I was doing at the time for my hopes of being able to contribute something. And for the first couple of years of medical school, I maintained my atheist perspective, feeling that there was really nothing worth examining that couldn't be examined by science. And then in my third year as a medical student, where I was now placed at the bedside of people who were suffering with terrible illnesses that I knew we probably weren't going to be able to cure, I had to really start to wrestle with these big questions like, why am I here? What is the meaning of life? Is there a God? Does God care about me? What happens after you die? And in a particularly seminal moment, an elderly woman who was my patient shared her faith with me and then unexpectedly turned to me and said, you haven't said anything about what you believe. What do you believe, doctor? Just those four words, what do you believe? How many people around you, if you asked them that question, would have a confident answer. Well, maybe many would, but I sure didn't. And it was incredibly disturbing to realize that I had not really spent the kind of time that would be necessary to answer probably the most important question that I'd ever been asked. And over a two-year period of much struggle trying to shore up my atheism, <laughs> to my surprise, I found that atheism was the least rational of all the choices, the assertion of a universal negative, which scientists aren't supposed to do. And agnosticism ended up feeling like kind of a cop-out, like I don't want to go too far down this road. And ultimately, with a lot of help from C.S. Lewis and beginning to understand what the words of the Bible were all about, I began to see that actually, for me, the most rational choice was going to be to become a believer in God. But then what kind of God would that be? I had to survey the world's religions and try to figure out what they said, and they had a lot in common. But one thing that Christianity stood out in a way that solved a huge problem for me was the person of Jesus. Because I had become aware that God probably was out there and God probably cared about me and I was a million miles away from being in a place where I felt I could have relationship or even approach the holiness of God. I needed some kind of way to bridge that gap. And you know what that way turned out to be, Jesus Christ. And so I fell on my knees in my 27th year uh, in a dewy grass on an early morning in the Cascades of the Northwest, and I gave my life to Christ. 
And that was 46 years ago. <laughs> now people said, well, your head's going to explode because <laughs> you're a physician and you think you want to study genetics and can't you realize this is going to be totally incompatible? And without going through step by step, I can tell you in those years, I have never once encountered a place where I really saw an irreconcilable conflict between what I know as a scientist, and I'm going to be really rigorous about that part, and what I know as a believer, and I'm somebody who reads the Bible pretty much every day. We humans have figured out ways to identify conflicts, but if one can stand back and realize uh, what sage uh, readers of those scriptures have been saying over many centuries, oftentimes those conflicts melt away. And for me as a scientist, I'm happy to also share, especially for people who are trying to find answers and looking for a reason to believe, that actually nature is pretty good at pointing you to some of those. I mean, the very basic philosophical question, why is there something instead of nothing? Science cannot help you with that. The Big Bang, that there was a beginning to the universe. What could have happened before that? It sort of cries out for a creator, doesn't it? And the creator can't be limited in space and time or you haven't solved the problem. What Wigner, the physicist, called the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. That mathematics works to describe how nature works. Those laws, whether it's Maxwell's equations for electromagnetism or just the law of gravity, simple, beautiful equations. That seems like an intelligence, doesn't it? And then when you look at those equations, they have constants in them, and they have the value that we've measured. You can't derive what the value of the gravitational constant should be. It just is. But then people began to imagine, suppose it wasn't that. Suppose it was off by just a little bit, maybe one part in a billion. And guess what? The whole thing doesn't work anymore. You end up with some particles flying apart, maybe, but you never get anything like complexity that could give rise to what we're doing here right now, the complexity that gives the possibility of life and intelligence. Again, seems like an intelligence who was an awfully impressive physicist and knew exactly how to set this up so that it would have some meaning. And then there's the moral law and how it is that down through all the civilizations that we know about, people have agreed that there's something called good and we should try to do what is good. Even though we disagree sometimes about what's on that list, nobody says, well, I don't care about good. At least very few people do. And where is that coming from? And you can argue that's an evolutionary development, but I think that leaves out some pretty interesting circumstances where people are willing to do acts of absolutely radical altruism, where they're putting their own lives at risk for people they don't even know, the Oscar Schindler kind of circumstance. Evolution thinks that's a scandal. So something there that also feels like a signpost. We could have a long conversation about whether that is a compelling argument or whether that's a god of the gaps, but I think it's pretty intriguing. And I've yet to meet an atheist who will tell you that good and evil don't matter. They say, oh yes, we should strive to be good. Well, why? <laughs> There's not an easy answer to that unless you're anchored in faith. So I very much found through the course of these 46 years, not a conflict, but an increasing sense of harmony between what I know as a believer and what I know as a scientist. And I love what Jesus said when asked, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Because it looks like he's quoting Deuteronomy, but he changed it just a little bit. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. That's not in Deuteronomy, but that's in Matthew. We are called to use our minds to love the Lord. That sounds like something a scientist would really get into. And so out of my experience, bringing together these views of truth, um, I have learned to love the moments where those things become particularly visually appealing. And there's no image I like better than this one, which is a comparison of a stained glass window. And you've seen many of these in beautiful churches. But what's on the right there, that's DNA. Not in the usual way where you look at it from the side where you can see that double helix. You're looking down the long axis, the barrel of the DNA, and here you see this gorgeous radial pattern. The beauty that we have been given in creation is exquisite. And of course, you experience it every day, maybe with a beautiful sunset, but we as scientists also get to experience it in things like this. So I had the privilege, beginning in 1993 to come to the National Institutes of Health and take the role of leading the Human Genome Project. 
As a believer, this felt like pretty significant stuff, that we're reading our own instruction book, the way in which all of us, beginning as a single cell, become increasingly complicated over a few weeks and months, and now here we are. And all the biological instructions have to be in that genome, those three billion letters. And that felt like an adventure, both of a scientific sort, but also sort of a theological sort, and hence my sense that this really is the language of God that we are reading out. And that achieved its goals back in 2003. Uh, fortunately for me, because Congress was watching over this rather closely, it was done ahead of schedule and under budget, which <laughs> does not happen, not happen a lot in Washington. And I continued working on genome research for another five years, and then I got asked to come and be the director of the whole National Institutes of Health, something that I never in my dreams imagined would be something I would be called to do. And it was a great honor to do so, and as you heard, subsequently served three different presidents over the next 12 years. And that gave me a chance to start new parts of NIH that were focused on taking basic science and bringing it to clinical applications, starting an initiative on the brain to try to understand how those 86 billion neurons between your ears do what they do, which is just amazing stuff. Uh, starting a program, which maybe some of you have joined, but if you haven't, you can by going to joinallofus.org, enrolling a million people who share a, a lot about their health, their electronic records, they give blood samples, they have their genomes completely sequenced, they answer all kinds of questionnaires, and they are the partners that we need to really sort out. How do we take not just treating disease, but preventing disease, and do it in a way that understands the differences between individuals, so-called precision health. And things are happening now that I find incredibly gratifying, that we don't just have the chance to diagnose illnesses, we're curing things like sickle cell disease now, which I did not know would happen in my lifetime. And now, somewhat to my surprise, uh, for the last 15 months, unexpectedly, I got asked to come and serve as a science advisor in the White House. And I'm working right now in an effort to try to eliminate a terrible disease that kills 15,000 people every year, for which we have a cure called hepatitis C, and I think we can do that. So all of that has been amazing, and I would say, were it not for the topic that I'm here to talk about this evening, I would feel like this is all in a perfectly beautiful place in our country. But we have at the same time this increasing sense of divisiveness and conflict and a distrust of a lot of the things that I've just been telling you about. So let's talk about some definitions. Truth. You wouldn't think you need to define this, but I actually had to think about it a bit and read what some other people said to really try to figure out what is the essence of truth. It is a concrete reality that is independent of us, which is to say, if somebody says, well, my truth is not the same as your truth, then there's a problem there with the definition of truth. Truth doesn't care <laughs> how we feel about a particular fact, and it doesn't depend on whether we're feeling good or bad about it. But we as humans have this hunger. Even the, the, the uh, folks who are not believers will say, what is specific about humans? The hunger for truth, goodness, and beauty. Isn't that interesting that people who are not of faith, that's what they say is unique about humanity. Truth, goodness, and beauty. Okay, so I think with those definitions, we'd say that's pretty darn important. I'll give you some scriptures in a moment. Science is not the same as truth, but it is a way that you can sometimes determine truth. It depends on experimentation, theory, challenge, revision. It can lead to wrong conclusions, which are not truth. But science is inherently self-correcting because people try to repeat that. Or they come along with a new idea and shoot down the previous one. That is the beauty of science. It is the way to discover truth about nature, but you can't count on yesterday's experiment necessarily being the final answer. So it's reliable, it's important, it's something we should, in general, uh, look to for answers when we're trying to find truth. Okay, what about trust? Trust is confidence in the character, ability, strength, reliability, or, or truth of someone or something. Is it given or is it earned? You can find a lot of arguments about that in various essays. I think these days especially, most people would say, you've got to earn my trust before I'm going to actually believe what you say. But there are certainly instances where we give our trust because we feel it's appropriate to do so without having seen the evidence of that being earned maybe for your parents. It, this is so true right now, it takes years to build. 
seconds to break, and forever to repair. Right now, we have a lot of breakage, a lot of trust that normally would be there in institutions and in individuals has been badly shaken, and we're having a really hard time figuring out, okay, who do you trust? Now, faith is a belief with strong conviction, but, okay, without absolute proof. I, my book I wrote <laughs> said scientists presents evidence for belief. I didn't say proof, because I don't think God gave us the opportunity to absolutely incontrovertibly to the ability to shoot down any skeptics, proof. <laughs> Gave us an awful lot of evidence, but not proof. So there's faith in there. That is that leap. You can have faith in a person or in promises, but tonight we're talking about faith in the sense of belief, trust, and loyalty to God. So that's the sort of context. And now I have to talk to you about a circumstance over the last three years that has really shaken me up, and I think shaken our world up in terms of how science, faith, truth, and trust got all out of joint. And it's this. It's the arrival of the coronavirus in January 10th of 2020, when we first saw the letters of the code of that virus and knew what it was, uh, a lot of effort had to swing into gear right away. And as my job at that point, being the director of the National Institutes of Health, was try to bring together all of the partners that would be needed for therapeutics, for diagnostics, and particularly for vaccines, to do something faster than it had ever been done before, not worry too much about who was going to get the credit, and just get it done and find all the resources that were necessary. I worked 100 hours a week for most of 2020, and most of the people around me were doing the same. You felt like every day, that we make a mistake, lives are at risk. It's almost like we've gotten a little numb to what that was like back in 2020 when we did ha not have a vaccine. We didn't really know exactly what this virus was. It kept changing its appearance. We kept finding out new things about it, like, oh my gosh, you can be infected and not know it and spread it to other people. The vaccines were such a big push and this was done using this mRNA approach that had never been done before to go all the way to an approved vaccine. It had to go to phase one trials where volunteers were willing to be the first to receive it. Those looked pretty good. Then you had to scale that up to phase two and phase three. And ultimately, 30,000 people volunteered, God bless them, to take part in a trial where they didn't know if they were getting the vaccine or maybe a dummy shot. And then they were watched over the course of several weeks to see if they got COVID or not, and if so, if they got really sick. And nobody knew, except the people who kept the code, who got the vaccine and who didn't. And there comes that moment on a late November evening where the code is going to be broken. And I had prayed a lot about this. And I had hopes that maybe it would work, because most vaccines don't, and that maybe it would be as good as, you know, 50% effective. And when the code was broken, 95%. And with no real serious concerns about safety and 30,000 people, we later found out there were rarer events of a safety problem, but in that kind of frequency, uh, we couldn't see that in just 30,000. And I had this remarkable moment of being both scientifically exhilarated, because this may in many ways be the finest hour that science has had, maybe ever, doing this in 11 months, but also this sense of gratitude and I confess, I cried rather unabashedly in front of my colleagues at this revelation. And I thought, okay, we're going to be all right. We now have something to protect people. We can quickly get shots into arms. And shots started to go into arms. And this is a graph of what that looked like. And yeah, for the first part of 2021, a lot of sleeves were being rolled up. But then about the middle of the month, it kind of dropped off rather steeply. And it was becoming more and more clear that not everybody saw the reasons to do this. And more and more misinformation was coming out there and there were conspiracies about there were chips in, in the vaccine that Bill Gates was gonna track you. Uh, and the, it was gonna make you sterile. It was maybe something that was causing people to make a lot of money who shouldn't be doing so. The, some of those were about me. Um, if you saw my car, you'd know that wasn't true. And, you know, this would have been frustrating enough. It was just a disagreement. But people were dying. And what was the group that had the greatest resistance to vaccines? This is a survey that was done back by the Pew folks at about that time. And, yes, white evangelicals, 40% 
unlikely to be vaccinated for COVID-19 because of their concerns. And these are good, wonderful, honest, terrific, hardworking people who I know in my church and in many other places, but they had been so much concerned about the information that was coming at them from social media, from cable news, from who knows where, uh, that they were standing back. Again, this feels like an unfortunate misinformation, but it's much more than that. That's Josh Tidmore on the left and his wife, Christy. He um, and his wife in Alabama, part of a church in Alabama that was founded by Josh's grandfather. They heard the vaccines were available, thought about this, talked to some of their friends, heard some concerns about whether these were safe or not, specifically heard concerns about whether some of the people involved in this, like Dr. Fauci, were on the take and decided, no, we're young, we'll be okay, uh, we'll skip this. And then they got sick. And Christy got better pretty quickly in August of 2021, but Josh got sicker and sicker. And over the course of three weeks, he's in the ICU, he's on a ventilator, and Josh died three days before his 37th birthday with three little kids. Josh is one of thousands of people not all of them over 70 who lost their lives to this virus in a way that probably could have been prevented. And Christy, recognizing this, tried to spread the word to her family, to her neighbors, to her community. And in her church, she was attacked. Like, you aren't really trying to tell us that this was a real virus. There was still so much misinformation about whether COVID-19 even existed. How heartbreaking, and how heartbreaking that of all places where grace and love should have abounded instead, uh, she was surrounded by criticism and basically uh, lost her connection uh, to her whole faith community. So how did this happen to God's people? How did we end up in a place where of all the communities that should have been most ready to rally, rally uh, to the truth, uh, God's people got caught up in other things? Well, okay, let's admit, there's a long-standing undercurrent of distrust of science and of scientists. Are they all atheists? A lot of people think so. I'm here to say that's <laughs> not true, and so is Deb, and so are about 40% of working scientists who believe in a God who answers prayer. That's a statistic you can bank on. Are they elitists? Yeah, sometimes we come across that way. Have we been giving out conflicting messages? I will take responsibility for having done that quite a few times not making it clear enough the nature of science, that you do the best you can with the information in front of you, but you might be wrong, and you might have to change that later. So yeah, there was a reason maybe to be a little skeptical, but then we had other things like political messages, and some of them were absolutely the opposite of the Sermon on the Mount in terms of what kinds of principles were being put forward, and yet they overtook faith principles. And as some of my pastor friends would say, it seemed to reveal that there was a weakness in Christian spiritual formation and even catechism, that people were not well enough prepared to quote back the scriptures that said, no, I am not going to accept your fear. I was not given a spirit of fear. Cable news won the battle for attention tenfold over Sunday morning. Social media, very good at spreading things that make you angry and fearful and not so good at spreading love and truth. Tribalism, divisiveness, and vitriol overtaking all of our better angels. And then the real casualties, like Josh uh, estimates now, 200,000 people are in graveyards today unnecessarily because all this misinformation deprived them of the chance to make a decision that could have saved them. So this shook me up beyond words. It still does. I hope it shakes you up too because this is a, a, a diagnosis that is quite severe and requires some kind of response. And I thought, how did this happen? I always, as a guy who is sort of a scientist, I figured you put facts in front of people, they make rational decisions. We're all rational actors. Well, guess what I found out? We're not, and I'm not either. I thought this guy, Descartes, I kind of had it right. I think, therefore I am. Everything can be derived from reason and it'll all turn out right. Well, if you had a Super Bowl and you had Descartes against David Hume, I think David Hume would win the Super Bowl based upon the evidence around us. Hume saying, reason is a slave of the passions. 
that if you think you're being reasonable, well, yeah, your passions are actually leading the charge. I like Blaise Pascal's way of saying it better, but it's sort of the same thing. The heart has its reasons, which reason knows nothing of. We all do. I do. I was pretty blissfully unaware of that until I really started to understand a bit deeper uh, how these kinds of phenomena affect all of us. If you want to read more about that kind of concept, uh, Jonathan Haidt's book, The Righteous Mind, is a really good one. And he has this metaphor that is the rider and the elephant. Uh, the rider is the reasonable part of us saying, OK, I know what to do. The elephant is the passions, and the elephant's going to decide where you go. And the rider thinks the rider's in charge, but it's really the elephant who's calling the shots. Another book that I think is very worth looking at, a different Jonathan, the Constitution of Knowledge. How do we as a society arrive at what we think is true? And what's happened to us now that we don't seem to be able to agree on that? This is a pretty serious circumstance indeed, and Rauch has many ideas about possible solutions to that. In scripture, there's plenty of reasons that we as people of faith, as followers of Jesus, should be troubled about this. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. You will know the truth, the truth will set you free. Truth just appears over and over again. And then there's the other side of this, which is really sobering when you think about what's happening right now. Go and look at Proverbs chapter 6. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. I've never figured out why it's six and then it's seven, but look at what they are. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. Sounds like Twitter to me. <laughs> and this are the things the Lord hates, and we as Christians ought to be the ones standing up saying, no, we're not going to take part in those things. And it's not just Christian faith, certainly. Even the Quran, oh, you have faith, be wary of Allah and be with the truthful, the Buddha, of those three things that cannot be long hidden, the sun, the moon, and the truth. So trying to understand this, I figured, okay, I must be in a bubble too, and I probably have been. I need to really understand what's going on uh, in the circumstances of all those people who have lost their trust in science, at least when it comes to things like the vaccine. So I joined up with a group called Braver Angels, and I'd recommend to you, if you get the chance, uh, to join in one of their sessions, because they have them all over the country. Basically, they try to bring together people with very strongly opposing views on a topic. For me, it was all about public health. And they bring them together for a couple of hours, and you are entitled to say what you think as boldly, except you can't attack anybody. And then you have to reflect back to the people what they said. So you actually have to listen so that you can actu accurately describe their perspective. And then after a while, you have to start talking about what mistakes you might have made, because we all make them. And then everything seems to get a lot easier in terms of being honest with each other. And ultimately, at the end of a couple of hours, it, every time, and I've probably done this more than a dozen times, you go around the room and everybody says, you know, I realize we're not that far apart. If we could scale that up and just do that uh, across the whole country, we might be in a better place. One of the things I've learned from this is a concept which I want to explain to you, and maybe it'll help you too, because I'm rather fond of it now in terms of putting this conflict in, in a good place. By the way, I have a foil at Braver Angels who always takes the opposite side from me, and this is Wilk Wilkerson, who's a trucker in Minnesota. And Wilk is wrong about almost everything, but he's my friend. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I mean both of those. <laughs> And so how does uh, Wilk, whose views I'll explain to you in a minute, uh, defend where he is at? And do, how do we find something in common? Well, now I need another philosopher, the guy with the beret over there on the right, with a handle of Willard Van Orman Quine. And he, Quine, comes up with this concept of the web of belief, a spider web, if you will. And look at a spider web. The central nodes in that web are really important. If you mess with those, the thing is going to come apart. But some of those more peripheral threads out there, well, you know, if one of those broke, your web would still be all right. That's how our belief system is. We have things in the middle and things on the side and things in between. So what about my web of belief? What would I put? I'd say science is trustworthy. That's what my whole profession is about. 
I'd say my wife loves me. If you're going to try to tell me otherwise, I'm going to resist you very strongly. Okay, there you go. That's my passion is driving my reason because I do believe that and I'll be very threatened if you have evidence to the contrary. My cat loves me. Uh, okay, that's quite a bit further out. Jesus died for me. That's in the middle of my web. If you're going to try to tell me the resurrection isn't true and you found the bones of Jesus in a tomb somewhere, I'm going to resist you very strongly and I'm going to demand to see the most amazing amount of data before I'll even talk to you about that. I'm a little less clear about pre- and post-millennialism, so I, I, that one doesn't make it to the center. And I'm sorry if that bothers people, but I just never have quite understood how to land on that one. <clears throat> Vaccines are safe and effective. Yeah, you notice I didn't put that all the way to the middle because I know vaccines do, in rare instances, have serious side effects. Public health needs experts. Yeah. The CDC is always right. Uh, I didn't make that one all the way to the middle. They're wonderful, hardworking public servants, but sometimes they get it wrong. Sometimes I get it wrong. Mandating masks in schools was essential. Ah. Uh, Maybe at some point in some circumstances, but not nearly to the degree that ended up happening. Climate change is real. Oh, yeah, you heard from Dr. Harzma just all the evidence for that and how unfortunate it is that less than a quarter of evangelical Christians do seem to see that as caused by human activity. The election. I mean, look at all the evidence. Joe Biden won the election. I mean, come on. <laughs> racism. Is structural racism real? I think there's strong evidence that over the course of 400 years, our country has been affected by slavery, and the consequences of that are still with us. What about Wilk? Okay, it's a different web. Right in the center, government's number one and primary duty is to protect the individual from undue force and fraud, not ruin their lives. He feels pretty strong about that. I get that. I'm learning about this from his perspective of what it has felt like in Minnesota uh, for the things that have been happening. His wife loves him too. <laughs> he doesn't have a cat. <laughs> uh, he's proud but not confident that he's instilling virtues in his children. He also is a believer. Jesus died for him. The resurrection is true. God created all things, is in control of all things. We can bond together on this. Some vaccines are safe and effective, but mandates are unacceptable. You can see where he's coming from. Government intrusion into the medical relationship is damaging. His are quite long. Government's response to the pandemic will go down as one of the most damaging mistakes in U.S. history. A mandating mask was ineffective and inappropriate. Uh, climate change is real. Weather caused by man's activity is debatable. And destroying the economy to combat it is unacceptable. And the integrity of the 2020 election was damaged greatly by media. He doesn't say whether it was, in fact, ultimately correct in terms of the consequence. And he responds to racism with critical race theory is harmful. I think CRT is an unfortunate term these days. Systemic racism is not nearly the problem in today's society. So you can see, we are in a very different place, but as I told you at the beginning, we are good friends, because I have learned a lot from him, and I can see from his perspective why he says all those things, and I needed to know that, and I didn't until I spent time with Braver Angels. So is it hopeless? Our webs are very different, but they don't just float free in the air. Web's got to attach to something. They have to be anchored. This is what I hadn't thought about. We both agree there's way too much hate. So I think concept now to bring to you is the idea that the webs have to attach to something. And I'm going to attach them now to these pillars. There's actually a verse in Proverbs, wisdom has built her house. She has set up its seven pillars. Proverbs doesn't say what the seven pillars are. I'm not telling you I have special insight here, but it's interesting that I came up with seven. And before I found this verse, <laughs> And you can see, we're back to love and beauty and goodness. We're back to freedom and faith and family and, yes, truth. And Wilk would say, absolutely. I'm totally with you on that. You got it right. Now, we could maybe think about adding one or two others. But who in this 
place would disagree with those being important priorities. But we attach our webs to those in different ways. But they're still attached to the same pillars. That gives me hope that if we can get past the urgency of some of these current strongly passionate responses to things like COVID and find our way back down to those pillars, we may realize that we have so much more in common than we had been counting on. So how do we find hope then in these dark times? We do still share those. Many people of faith do sense that something is deeply wrong. I can't imagine too many people here tonight would say, oh, we're, we're fine, there's no difficulty. A return to truth and love and grace should be possible. I'm reclaiming our foundations as people of faith. They're very strong, and it starts with each of us. I would say it's also starting with our institutions that are in trouble, and we need them. Institutions have to flourish or we will not flourish, and so we can't gratify ourselves by tearing them down without recognizing the consequences. We maybe need to reform them, but we don't want to tear them down. I wonder whether you would be willing to make a pledge that would go something like this. As of now, I am not going to pass on information to anybody unless I am absolutely confident it's true. <laughs> I'm not going to hit that button on the social media uh, to start transmitting uh, some new information that made me mad unless I was really sure that it was accurate because most of it will turn out not to be. We need coalitions. Like-minded groups maybe could show the way. Maybe here in the Bay Area, I'm sensing uh, there is opportunity of things like that uh, with TBC, for instance. And then keep in mind what Churchill said. <laughs> if you're going through hell, keep going. <laughs> Don't stop there and say, oh, well. And it kind of feels like we have been doing that. Keep going. Let us not uh, lose hope. Uh, and let us not grow weary by doing good. Let us all agree. It's certainly a time for urgent prayer and reflection and for action and for all of us to figure out again, how do we find the sources of truth that we really can trust and know that they are giving us truth and not something else? We need to be more selective, I think. Finally, let us all bring ourselves back together again. The divisiveness in our own churches is heartbreaking to see churches falling apart because arguments about masks, for heaven's sakes, and essential things, unity. In non-essential things, like liberty, uh, that would be a mask. In all things, charity. Let's recover those principles once again. And then maybe the church can be that light on the hill that brings our society back to a place of love and grace. Thank you all so much. Well, thank you so much for being part of this conversation. We're going to extend the conversation just a little bit and just have a sort of a lightning round of questions that I'm going to pose to both of them, and you'll get to overhear their answers. And we're going to concentrate this lightning round on the most base, visceral emotions, since both of them talk so much about emotions as actually the driver uh, for us. So I'm going to start with the visceral emotion that you've talked a lot about, Francis, distrust or suspicion or fear. Mm. And we've been talking about dis how much Christians, a percentage of Christians seem to distrust science. I wonder if the better way or a more precise way is they distrust scientific institutions because it's not like the 40% of folks who were distrusted the vaccine were peering into the molecular structure of the vaccine and said, that looks fishy to me, <laughs> right? They were distrusting the FDA, the CDC, the NIH, big pharma, mm -hmm. government in general and so forth. So, this presents a challenge because how do you, you can't do science without institutions. Science is an institutional activity. <clears throat> so how do we overcome distrust when the distrust seems to be about institutions, but you can't do science without institutions? It's a great question, and it's certainly reflective of just how serious this is. And I said just one sentence earlier, if we lose trust in institutions, our society is in real trouble. If you can't figure out a way uh, to trust nonprofit organizations, scientific societies, um, uh, medical facilities uh, that are taking care of you, 
um, churches, uh, then the individual alone is not going to be able to pull us out of this, even though it is up to individuals both to change their own perspective about how to find truth and to help the institutions uh, recover the trust that they seem to have lost. One of the things that I sort of think might help here a lot would be to empower scientists who are not part of institutions, who are out there in the community, the teachers in the high school, uh, the graduate students in universities, uh, every member of a scientific society, all the physicians to say, okay, it is now part of your job to be science communicators because you have some level of trust because of your, your yeah. professional expertise. Uh, don't count on some top-down edict coming uh, from the government to say what we know and what we don't know. This has got to become much more of a participatory communication that involves all the people who are fortunate to be in a place to know the facts. And that's part of their job too. And I think a lot of scientists would probably do that if they were given some good materials <laughs> and some, uh, some reassurance that they're not gonna get attacked for it, but it's gotta be part of the solution. And maybe then you could start through that effort to build some reforms into the institutions themselves so that they would regain the confidence of the public. But as I said in that one little quote, uh, trust yeah. takes years to develop, seconds to break. That's right. And almost forever to regain. Yeah. And we are in a real bad place uh, for a lot of the institutions that our future depends on. Okay. All right, Deb, I'm going to turn to you for visceral emotion, feeling number two, hope. Because you spoke a lot about hope. And interestingly, you spoke about hope while also speaking about climate change. And my experience is that there's a pervasive hopelessness mm. that surrounds climate change. And it's what actually drives most people to want to avoid dealing with it. Is they just, it's hopeless. Nothing we can do about it. So let's not think about it. So how do we re-inject hope into the conversation around climate change. So you almost need to take a step of mourning in between, mm. of actually grieving what has been lost. Uh, we did that in a podcast series last year called Creation Groans, and so I encourage people to check that out. But I, often we kind of skip over that engagement of like, okay, yeah, things really are bad. We really have lost a lot. And it's coming out of the other side of that where we see, okay, there are actions we can take. And the thing about Christian hope is you keep going and acting even when the circumstances aren't good, even when it's not obvious that it's making a difference. God doesn't call us to be effective and have a great strategic plan that's gonna accomplish it. God calls us to be faithful. And ideally, yes, it will also accomplish it, but our first task is to just be faithful and do what God calls us to do. Um, I know a lot of people who are in this field who've been seeing, like ecologists and climate scientists, the way they process it is about every year, they're like, okay, what's one new thing I can do in my life? Maybe it's eating less meat. Maybe it's um, uh, reducing my electrical usage or turning down the thermostat. And you know, every year just sort of saying, okay, what's one new thing I can do? I'm not trying to do everything all at once but developing those practices. And it feels like a spiritual discipline in a way. Okay. All right, Francis, visceral emotion number three, fear. I'm coming to you for oh, fear. <laughs> <laughs> See, I get um, the good ones. I got hope, you get fear. <laughs> exactly. Um, when, you, when we talk about the field of genetic uh, medicine, there's certainly a lot of promise, but I sense also in the general populace a undercurrent of fear. Uh, especially, even, I would say, among Christians, that is this going too far? Are we crossing lines here? Um, and, and they may not even know exactly what to fear, but that pervasive sense of something, like when we start talking about uh, genetic uh, alterations, uh, this is going too far. So speak to how do we address that pervasive fear? It's a great question, and I think it's another reason why you want to have in the scientific community doing these kinds of cutting-edge advances, uh, people who are thinking uh, about the moral consequences of those actions. Scientific discoveries generally don't have an immediate moral aspect to them, but the, what you decide to do with them certainly can. The whole revolution about CRISPR, the gene editing effort, has a remarkable sort of example of this. This is the way that we are now taking people who have suffered for years with sickle cell disease and offering them chance to be cured in a way that I think is entirely compatible with the highest ethical standards, and not to mention benevolence and uh, the kinds of things we all want to do in terms of helping people who are suffering. 
But if you could take that same gene editing approach and start to modify a human embryo to change the very nature of the biology of that individual, then I am way, way concerned about what that would mean. And fortunately, at the moment, uh, the world seems to agree, except it was already done once uh, by a renegade Chinese scientist. So we should be worried about things like that. that. That is the image of God that you're messing with when you get to the point of changing the very biology, inventing almost a new species by our monkeying around with our own genome. And I would feel a lot better going forward if the next generation of scientists who wrestle with these issues was heavily populated with Christians. Mm. And I do worry that at the present time, with what seems to be a battle between science and faith, we are scaring off a lot of our next generation of really brilliant young people mm. who love science, who love Christ, and are unfortunately beginning to conclude they can't do both. We need those people, and that's what BioLogos has mm. positioned itself to try to help with. All right, Deb, I want to talk about beauty. And this See, is, I keep getting the good ones. You get, yeah, yeah, well, it's great. You know, Fear, I'm trying beauty, to be chivalrous here. Um, yeah. um, <laughs> Um, okay. Beauty. I want to talk about beauty because I was really struck, and I don't know if any of you were struck by this, but you know the popular impression, stereotype of a of a scientist is cold, clinical, rational, <laughs> and yet looking at both of your slides, how much there was a sense of beauty. I mean, in the cross section of a DNA, in the in the pictures of the universe. Um, I want to talk about how it, that seems to be a part of science that we don't actually talk enough about that they're woven throughout science is an appreciation of beauty mm -hmm. and a response to beauty. So mm -hmm. you're leading BioLogos, mm -hmm. so you can determine the programming of BioLogos. How do we help <laughs> cultivate, especially in the next generation, but in the broader populace as well, this sense of beauty, awe, and, and wonder? Oh, yeah. yeah. It's so important to do, and we do make it a priority. It's throughout all of our content and all of our programs um, because it puts it on a completely different plane. We can talk about evidence and argument, but when you suddenly are talking about the wonder of watching an octopus swim around a coral reef and then suddenly change color to blend in with the reef, I mean, those videos are amazing. And, and it just takes you beyond yourself for a moment. You look up at the night sky and you go, wow, there is something here that's beyond my troubles. And that uh, change in posture does things to your body and it does things to your mind. It actually, there's one study that showed it made people more altruistic and willing to help others. Mm. It, so um, yeah, we need to cultivate it. And it's the most common thing throughout scripture when it's talking about the natural world, it's most often mm -hmm. talking about worship and about the glory of God being displayed in nature. So that should be our first and biggest encounter with the natural world and science as our way of apprehending the natural world. Unfortunately, in a lot of churches, the only time science comes up is when there's a controversy and science is the bad guy. And I would love for churches to be much more engaging, the wonder and awe, bringing that into a worship service and just the occasional mm. mention of, did you see that cool new scientific discovery that they found out about volcanoes under the ocean? You know, just to mention like that, and the kids will be like, whoa, we're talking about volcanoes in church? This is cool. <laughs> and they'll, they'll engage. So uh, if you go to the Biologos homepage right now, we've released a, a new worship video that brings in the web telescope images, beautiful three-minute video you can show it during mm. worship service and to help inspire that. Awe. That's lovely. Go check it out. All right, last one on this lightning round, and I got to give Francis, I got to give you a positive. Okay, okay, okay good. Uh, <laughs> excitement. Ooh. Uh, excitement. What should we be excited about at the frontiers of science? We're like, what, what's, oh. what's coming down the pike? Thank you, finally. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. This is... <laughs> it's a softball. Just this just is the <laughs> most amazing time in life sciences that you could possibly imagine. The ability to discover things about how life works and how disease can happen and what we can do about it is just on this exponential curve of discovery. Whether it's understanding how the brain works, we have a big project, and I briefly touched on that, uh, to understand how the circuits in your brain do what they do, and how do you actually lay down a memory and retrieve it? There's a mechanism there, but we don't understand it yet. We're gonna figure that out. And that's gonna have all kinds of consequences for disorders of the brain, like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and many others. And this whole revolution about being able to not only diagnose these genetic diseases, of which there are about 7,000 different diseases, but actually treat them or even cure them uh, with this opportunity to do what's being done for sickle cell disease. Mm. 
Uh, that, that's like tens of millions of people in this country alone. Uh, the opportunity with cancer, where we are starting to see instances by combining the study of the cancer using genome analysis, because cancer is a disease of the genome, but also getting the immune system into the action, figuring out how to take your immune system to graduate school and teach it what it should be looking for to catch those cancer cells before they get out of control. I'm starting to see in trials that we're doing at NIH, people with stage four pancreatic cancer or colon cancer or breast cancer who are being cured. Stage four isn't supposed to be curable, Maybe it's wow. starting to look like it could be. Early days yet. All of those things happening right now. So for anybody who's kind of trying to figure out as a young person, where is it I want to land? I can't imagine a more exciting place to land than biomedical research right now. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great word to answer to, to end on. Thank you very much. Well, thanks so much to Deb Harzma and Francis Collins for some wonderful presentations, to Curtis for moderating such a wonderful conversation as well, and to all of you for being here. This has been a really wonderful evening together. It's our mission at Biologos, as you've heard, to explore God's word and God's world to inspire authentic faith for today. And I want to take just a moment to highlight a few ways that you might come along with us in that journey as we work to move that mission forward. Later this year, uh, in October 7th at Grand Rapids, Michigan, we will be holding the Creation Care Summit, a one-day conference to bring together some really great scientists, Bible scholars, and communicators to pull together what we can learn from science and from scripture to better understanding the, understand the calling that God has for all of us to be better caretakers of God's magnificent creation. A little further down the road, uh, about a year from now, in Raleigh, North Carolina, April 17 to 19, we will be holding the Faith and Science Conference. This is our big biennial national conference. And if you talk to anyone who's been to one of these conferences before, I'm sure they'd tell you just what an incredibly impactful few days it is. An opportunity to learn from a slate of fantastic speakers, to meet fellow attendees from all different walks of life, and to spend time worshiping our Creator together over these days. I hope you'll mark those days on your calendar so that you can join us. If you want to listen in to more great conversations on faith and science, you could hardly do better than to follow our podcast at Biologos Language of God, which now has over 150 episodes with conversations with an incredible array of guests, people like Jane Goodall, N.T. Wright, Phil Vischer, Catherine Hayhoe, Bill McKibben, Jamar Tisby, and so many more. We just had a live podcast recording last night of Francis Collins with Deb Liu, CEO of Ancestry, a tech company in genomics based here in the Bay Area. An incredible conversation that will be popping up on the podcast feed before long. So we're sure to look up Language of God on your podcast app or on our website browse some of those past conversations, and hit subscribe so that you can get notifications when we have new episodes coming out. One more I want to highlight is Biologos Integrate. If you are a high school educator or know someone who is, be sure to check this out at biologos.org integrate. Integrate is a wonderful series of tools and resources for high school biology teachers that want to really want to pull together Christ-centered faith and rigorous science in a spirit of gracious dialogue to show the next generation of students how faith and science don't need a conflict, but can genuinely work together hand in hand for the good of our world. So there's a lot going on at Biologos for sure. Probably the best way to stay in touch with what we're doing is to sign up for our email list. You can scan the QR code that will remain on the screen behind me for the rest of the evening here. And uh, we can let you know as new resources come available, updates about our conferences and other events like this event tonight for next time we're in the area. And if you sign up, we'll also be able to reach out to you with a very brief, just six question sur 